Today is Tuesday, February 26, 2019. We're at the Fairmont Heights Library in the Dream Lab. My name is Kemar Roden, and I am with Vi Sharp, and I'm conducting an interview uh, for the Sojourner Truth African American Research Room's Speaker Truth Oral History Project. So tell us your name, where were you born, and how long have you been in PG County? My name is Violetta Sharps Jones. I was born in Lakeland, Maryland, which is now part of College Park, Maryland. I am a fifth generation Prince George's County resident. I've uh, been in Prince George's County most of my life. I did leave for a brief period of time, um, but my family always remained in Prince George's County. Okay. Uh, at what point did you start coming to Fairmont Heights? My connection with Fairmont Heights came in 1961 when I came to Femmer Heights High School in the ninth grade and, and continued in Femmer Heights until graduation in 1965. Okay. And could you describe for us what, what your experience was like attending Fairmont Heights High School? The year that I started Femmer Heights High School was the year that I had the opportunity to integrate Northwestern High School, which was much closer to where I lived in the community of Lakeland. Um, I was given a choice, and after careful consideration through my parents' guidance, um, we decided that I would come to Fairmont Heights High School. And that decision was made uh, mainly because my parents were concerned about the negativity of being the first in a predominantly white school. She didn't want um, the social changes to interfere with me being educated. She also knew the staff at Fairmont Heights High School because most of those teachers had come from Lakeland High School, which had just closed in 1950, and Fairmont Heights opened in 1950. So it had a rich he history, and I so much look forward to attending Femra Heights High School um, for that reason. So, Ms. Sharp, uh, tell us a little bit more about your experiences at Fairmont Heights, maybe like what the teachers were like, what were your classmates like, uh, who attended the school, uh, as, much, as much as you'd like to share about that. Uh, when I first came to Femmer Heights uh, in 1961, um, it was a much larger school than I was used to, so that was one adjustment that I had. Um, but the teachers, a lot of the teachers I didn't know, and um, I feel that we developed a close relationship with those teachers. What was great about coming into Femmer Heights is that now you're part of a very large family of teachers and staff and students. The students that came into Femmer Heights came as far south as Akakee, Maryland, and as far north as Laurel, Maryland. And so now you learn a little more about all of those individual communities that fed into Femmer Heights. So it was very interesting. Um, we socialized um, not necessarily in the individual com communities on an everyday basis, but we would have special events. One of the things that combined all of the communities were um, we had a teen club association. Every black community had teen club. Teen Club was held Friday, Fridays from 8 p.m. till 11 p.m. They were always chaperoned by parents and friends in the individual communities. And, and any Friday night, um, stu students or friends could come and visit your Teen Club, or we would have a special event 
and sometime we would get on a bus and we would travel to North Brentwood's Teen Club or Vista's Teen Club or Femmer Heights Teen Club or Chapel, Ho Chapel Oaks Teen Club. And um, that was our, the way we socialized. Um, we also had special social events that would occur, like taking boat rides um, down to Marshall Hall. Um, those were, and then big festivals like jamborees, and we would get on a boat and we'd just go and we'd just have a good time. And those were generally held on Fridays, and again, it would be from the time period of 8 p.m. to 11. And we just enjoyed uh, each other. Um, going to school in a segregated environment, um, to me, you got a level of caring from your teachers that's very different from what my children experience today from schools. Teachers really cared about you, I think, because they had such a struggle to become teachers. They knew the value of education, and that was always transferred to us. Um, at Femmer Heights, we had one principal, um, Mr. Golson, and he was just a very unique person, and he instilled in all of us to do your best. And he had no problem calling you out when you knew, he knew you had done something that was not right. And we would all straighten up. Fortunately for me, I was never called into the principal's office, but I had quite a few friends that uh, spent a lot of time in the principal's office but all, overall, I think the quality of education that we got was, was very well. And that sense of family, if you run into anyone that has gone to Femmer Heights, you are going to hear nothing but positive things, and they're going to talk about all of the good things that they shared together. Um, and that, to me, is, is remarkable, that you can think back 50 years and think about how wonderful the school environment was and, and what value that you got from that learning ex experience. All right. Could you, could you tell us a little bit about the physical makeup or layout of Fairmont Heights at the time you attended school? Uh, what were some significant uh, landmarks uh, also about you know, how did people travel? How did you travel to school, uh, and so on? Well, I had to travel to school on the yellow school bus, mm -hmm. and it took us probably about 20, 25 minutes to get from Lakeland, which is now part of College Park, Maryland, to Femmer Heights. Um, the neighborhood kids of the Femmer Heights area, uh, the communities of Inglewood, Chevrolet, um, Chapel Oaks, and those areas, they had a slight advantage because all of them, for the most part, could walk to school. Um, but any of the outlining communities like um, Mitchellville, Bowie, um, Akakeet, certainly, um, they had to use the school bus. We used to tease the kids that came from Akakeet that they came to school, it was dark, and when they left, it was dark, because it took them so long to travel. And now when you think of the boundaries, you wonder, why were they coming from Akakee to Femmer Heights? But that's just the way it was at that time. Um, the communities don't look a lot different today. Um, they may operate a little different, and certainly the um, diversity of those communities, I'm sure, has changed. But the communities that were the closest to Femmer Heights, their mode of transportation for the most part, of course they walked to school, but other activities, they easily had access to either the streetcars or the buses um, to go into D.C., um, whereas me living in College Park, I had to rely on my mode of public transit, I could use the streetcar to go into D.C. to do shopping and that kind of thing. But the communities were, or the way I was raised, we did not do a whole lot of socializing outside of our individual communities unless it was a special event. Um, so we kind of stayed 
the people from Lakeland are socialized a lot with Lakelanders, like on the weekends and things like that, through our churches <coughs> and um, through the rec centers, that sort of thing. So let's talk a little bit more about your experience uh, at Fairmont, High School, Fairmont Heights High School specifically. Uh, I know you were here for about five years. Uh, what were some of your, uh, well, what are some of your fondest memories uh, from Fairmont Heights High, High School? Who were some of your friends, uh, some of your favorite subjects? Just describe uh, uh, life then for, for us. Well, I would say my probably my favorite teacher was Miss Myrtle Fentrist. She was a very sh strict teacher, but she did she motivated you. Um, at that time, I think the class was called Core, which covered a whole bunch of d subjects. Um, one of my um, I don't know necessarily it's a fond memory, but it's a funny one. I was in the library, and um, I was maybe not focused on researching in the library. Instead, I had engaged in conversation, and Miss Prentress heard me talking. Not that anything was wrong with what I was discussing, but just the fact that I was talking maybe a little too loud in the library or what have you. And so she came over to me and asked who I was, and I gave her my name. And the moment I gave her my name as Vi Sharps, she said, Vi Sharps, you Lucille's daughter? That was my mother. Because a lot of the teachers that came to Femmer Heights had left Lakeland when they did that that closing of Lakeland High School, which was the forerunner of Femmer Heights High School. So my mother was part of the staff. She was the principal secretary at that time. So she knew all of the teachers. And like I said, the, the teaching staff at Lakeland High School as well as Femmer Heights High School was a very tight-knit family. Those teachers really cared about you. Um, and they loved teaching. So that was transferred to their students. So I did learn from that day on that whenever I came into the library, I must stay focused on whatever I was supposed to be in the library doing. But um, Femmer Heights, um, even with academics being stressed, it also, of course, focused on sports. We had wonderful um, sports teams. Um, basketball especially. Um, some of the after school activities that I participated in was I was a majorette for a while. Um, and of course we would come to Femmer Heights on the week weekends for football games and things like that. Um, I just enjoyed um, the activities, and I still have quite a few friends that were my friends from high school um, because a lot of us were so committed to Femmer Heights that we really tried to do what we could to support the school, support the principal, support the teachers. And even in the big change recently with Femmer Heights High School closing and the new one opening, a lot of my friends and family are on the committees that helped do a lot of the fundraising and, and a lot of the um, activities centered around making that transition happen. So I'm very proud of that. You, you mentioned uh, Lakeland High School mm -hmm. and you, you, you described it that is like the forerunner to uh, Fairmont Heights High School. Uh, mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit more about that. What, what happened um, and, and how did things transition, if, if in fact it did, from Lakeland to Fairmont Heights High School? Well, Lakeland is, like I said, now it's part of College Park, but it's a African-American community that was established in 1890. That community did not become incorporated, so that has a little different historical um, place with your African-American 
communities like North Brentwood, um, Glenarden, Femmer Heights, and Eagle Harbor. Uh, but Femmer Heights, I'm sorry, Lakeland did have a tremendous impact in the county because in 1928, it opened its second Rosenwald School. I don't know if you're familiar with Rosenwald Schools. Um, they were the, the funding that was given by um, Rosenwald, the owner of Sears and Roebuck. He generated these funds and started these schools realizing that blacks needed to be educated. And Lakeland's High School opened up in 1928 and it became the high school for all of the black communities from as far north as Savage, Savage Maryland, all the way to the Washington DC line, and even over to Mitchellville and Bowie. They all had to come into Lakeland for high school from 1928 until 1950. Um, and as I stated, a lot of the teachers that were there in Lakeland, to show you how committed some of these teachers were, they actually lived in our community. Monday through Friday, they would go home on the weekend and then they'd come back on Monday. So they really became a part of the fabric of the community. Um, you didn't fear them. You didn't, they were part of, part of your family. So you, you appreciated the gifts that they gave you. Um, I can remember one of the teachers, which is my all-time favorite teacher, is a lady named Edna McClellan. And I am convinced that my love of research and history came from her. She introduced me to the first set of encyclopedias, which is your forerunner of the internet. You know, before that, that's what we had. You had world book encyclopedias. And I was just fascinated that you could just think of a word or think of a place and you could go to that book and you could learn about that. And so that's what Ms. McClellan instilled in, in me. And I know once she left Lakeland, she went other places and became part of the staff at the University of Maryland teaching black history, whatever. Just a wonderful um, person. And um, that's the things that were instilled in me coming from the environment of Lakeland, and then merging into Femmer Heights. Um, so that, you know, that's, that was a gift. That was really a gift. So when, when the Femmer Heights High School was moved, what kind of feelings did you have? Um, because I imagine there was some attachment to Femmer Heights and its old location. Uh, with the move, how did that make you feel? Well, I remember when they first started talking about closing Femmer Heights, I was wondering why, because I always thought space-wise it was in a good location, and I always thought it was had a pretty good size. Now, what I did not know is had it kept up um, technology-wise with what's going on now, what was, what was the reason behind wanting to close it or feeling the need to close it. Um, and I know that we, we all sometimes would like to fight progress, but sometimes you just can't. And um, I'm glad that they have not physically removed the building, um, that it will be used in some other capacity to help the community. Um, that would be what my goal would be. But I also hope that in moving to a new building that it carries that history of the name of that school. Um, there are going to be kids that come to Femmer Heights that only know that new school. And will even wonder why is it named Femmer Heights. It's not in Femmer Heights, Maryland. It's located Chevrolet, I believe it is now. So. Um, that's where communication will help. If we keep the history of Femmer Heights alive so that new people coming in, new students coming in, appreciate 
the culture and the 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 know the people that came before them that helped create that environment for them then I think that's a positive thing that's a good thing so so if you were to describe in a, in a few short words what what family Heights high school meant to you what, what would you do that what, what, what would you it, it's just a uh, just a tremendous sense of family and I can only relate it to my two children and how their high school experiences are, even though they were good experiences, they don't have that connection to go back to their high schools, to their reunions, and they have a small group of uh, friends from those schools that they're still in touch with. Whereas with Femme Heights, everybody stays connected pretty much. Um, when I think about it, it's not just my classmates of 1965, but I've got my sister's class group. She graduated a year before me. I've got cousins that graduated several years before me. So I have the names and, and the connections of those kids, um, as well as the different age groups that came from Lakeland itself, you know. so. In that sense, it, it, it gives me uh, a lot of pride when I go somewhere and I'll just be out shopping and I'll say, see that person looks familiar to me. And you strike up a conversation with them and as soon as I hear that last name, I know, oh, they came from Femme Heights. They, we went to high school together or I went to high school with their sister or their uh, brother, you know. So, and my kids look at me like, what? because they don't have a concept of what that family connection is. Um, their schools were very different, and their associations with their classmates were very different. Um, when Femmer Heights has reunion dances and what have you, we get together. I mean, you would think no time has lapsed. <laughs> we're all in a time zone or <laughs> something, but we really enjoy it. And um, that's something that is lost today. The way our kids communicate is totally different. Um, but I appreciate that I have those fond memories of Femmer Heights. And as you mentioned the word family, uh, did, did you get that same sense of family uh, that, that it was shared within the community of Fairmont Heights as, as well? Or was this just restricted to the school? No, um, the communities were uh -oh. very well connected. I mean, um, sometime I would, when we would come back to school on Monday, you know, the kids that weren't from Lakeland or other communities that I was closer to in distance, they would be discussing the parties that they had gone to or different social things that they had done. And I always felt, oh, I, I wasn't part of that. And the reason I wasn't part of it is because you're talking about a time period where if you couldn't get on a, on the streetcar, and certainly very few of us were driving during those times, you had to rely on your parents taking you. And my parents just were not going to take me from Lakeland to Chapel Oaks to a party and sit out there and wait for me <laughs> to come. So you just didn't do that un unless you happen to have built a relationship with somebody, a close friend, and your parents were safe, were comfortable enough to allow you to sleep over, you know, s spend the weekend with them, then you became a part of their community a little more. Um, but for the most part, I just had to listen to them talk about how they got together. And, and it's always been um, church, community, and school. Those are the things that kind of drive your social activities. Um, and I think that was a very positive thing. As we, as we talk about the Fairmont Heights community, uh, can you remember some of the significant uh, community members? Can you share uh, stories about any of these people? Um, I re yeah, I remember some of the names. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of the facts about what they did because I might not have those right. But I know, um, for example, the last name of War. Um, 
Jesse War um, because he had a son that went to, was in my class with me, but I know his father, I believe, became a very prominent citizen in the community. We also had, um, I think it was Femmer Heights Middle School, elementary school maybe, there was a person from uh, Lakeland that became the principal there. His name was um, Robert Gray. Um, and I was trying to think of another prominent name. That was, oh, um, oh gosh, what was her name? Miss Pruden. She was a teacher, and I know she became very, she was very active in the community. Yeah. So, so, how would you now describe uh, to what extent our community has changed um, as far as this whole sense of family uh, and, you know, this community spirit from your observation now? How would, you, how would you describe that change? Well, I think as we become more diverse, um, we become more detached from each other. Um, instead of blending those differences, we tend to stay in separate corners, you know. Um, whereas in the segregated world, it wasn't like that. I mean, you you communicated, you talked to each other, you you didn't um, have those differences. And I think with today, I mean, it's a good thing that communities are becoming more diverse, but if you're not really learning about the other people and their cultures, then you're not gaining anything. You're, you're separating. And um, to me, that would be a negative influence on the community. So if somehow we could um, share more, have events where all groups are kind of socializing and, and learning the different cultures and what have you, then I think we would, would do a lot better. Uh, you mentioned segregation, uh, and I'd like you to, to talk a little bit more about uh, uh, what this kind of looked like or felt like back then. How, how did it affect you, if it did? Um, and you know, just share a little bit about uh, your experiences, if any, with segregation in, in Fairmont Heights. Uh, it probably affected a lot of people in different ways, but for me, it nurtured um, family, sense of family. Um, I don't feel that being brought up in a segregated environment had necessarily a ne negative effect on me. I was aware that there were certain things that we could not do, um, but on a daily basis, it didn't interfere with our living. And I would want people to realize that even within segregation, that blacks had a true sense of themselves and family and we thrived. I knew in Lakeland as well as other black communities, um, getting a good education was a must. It was, it was, um, it didn't even really have to be discussed. You were going to do this. Um, going to college was always an option for me. Now, was I restricted in my choice of college places? Yes and no, because I also uh, revered the black universities and college and, and wanted that because I knew that the quality of education that I had received on the elementary, junior, and high school level was good, so I could only expect more of that on a college level because, again, you have a teaching staff that truly knew what sacrifices had been made for them to be able to get a degree, to be able to teach you. So 
they're, they're not going to, they're, they're going to try to open up everything to you because they want you to realize that this is a path that you should take and this is what, you know, you will make you stronger. Um, so even though when I came up, there were very few people going to the University of Maryland College Park, let's say, which I could literally walk to. But it wasn't that we didn't go because of fear. It wasn't that we didn't go necessarily because we didn't think we could go. Um, your pull was greater toward Morgan and Howard and Bowie State University because that's what was, you, you revered those, those schools. So you were glad to go there. Um, I didn't look at it as, oh, these are my only choices. Um, I actually went to the University of Maryland College Park and was truly lost in the size and lost in the lack of diversity, you know, and it had an impact on me. I did not remain there. I did not stay there. That's something that I regret, but that's how I felt at the time. My, everybody was ecstatic that I got a scholarship to go to the University of Maryland, but um, it really wasn't a good fit for me, at least not at that time. So um, that's, you know, being raised in segregation, and I personally have experienced very little name calling and very negative aspects of uh, uh, being black. Uh, now, my parents were instilled in us that we could do anything that we wanted. I happened to be in a family that my parents, my, on my mother's side, they had already gone to college, so I wasn't even the first generation to go to college. Um, but I just, um, I didn't see segregation as a negative, where segregation has an impact is when someone tells you you can't go somewhere, can't do such and such because you are. Uh, but when you take that aside, in, in our communities, we had our social activities. Um, in Lakeland, they had these little formal social groups called the Counts and the Duchesses, and they used to get all dressed up. Um, my mother got married in 46, and when I see her wedding picture, they had tuxedos on. They had tails on. No, they had tails on. You know, so I would like people to walk away with knowing that within a segregated community, you had a good life sometimes, that you had um, people that were pulling for you. Um, it wasn't a woe is me, you know, uh, it wasn't a negative thing necessarily. There was nothing that I, I felt that I could not achieve if I wanted to. Um, so if I could instill that into my kids and anybody else's kids, that would be a good thing. Oh, you, you've talked about how uh, the community has changed in that uh, there has been a, a greater mix of culture and diversity. Uh, and I wonder if you could go back to, tell, to talk a little bit about um, what were some of the culturally significant things. Uh, certainly during your time at Fairmont Heights High School, what were some of the things you you always did, or, or, or that students always did, uh, or teachers for that matter. Uh, maybe tell us about the food, and mm -hmm. if we still enjoy some of those dishes now, and you know. Well, uh, culturally, I think we celebrate a little differently. Um, of course, things are centered around family, communities, and churches. And in any of those celebrations, food is a very important part of it. Um, sharing recipes um, and just experiencing the different music. I talked a little bit about um, the teen clubs, but the, t since the significance of the teen clubs were 
it was just a weekly celebration that we did, listening to the music and, and dancing and um, learning new dances and, um, and just enjoying each other in that aspect. Um, another thing that we used to do in the summers is locally here, there were two black beaches and they were located in Anne Arundel County. The properties were owned by one family, um, the cars, and they split up the beaches with the two daughters owning them. And one of them was called Sparrows Beach, and the other was called Cars Beach. So all summer long, and these beaches were in existence, I'm going to say from the early 1920s maybe, until the 70s. And they entertained us during the summer. You went there for swimming, but you went there for good food. You went there for the entertainment because they were all part of what was called the Chitlin Circuit, um, where all the black entertainers would go, and they just loved to come to Cars Beach. You also had, for adults, you had um, gambling, um, slot machines way before the big hotels and things we have today. Um, so you had gatherings that churches would take groups of people there all summer long um, just to enjoy the day and always with those type of outings it was um, quite an event because everybody packed their best lunch, their best chicken, their best potato salad whatever that was and they brought it to the beach and you would spend time visiting with other family members and other friends and socializing and sharing your food and everything. And we did that. I know from the, I participated in it from the early 60s until the beaches closed. Um, and most of our activities, those things were involved in. Music, dancing, food, you know, just good you know, community activities um, is what we did, and um, we, but that's what we enjoyed, um, whether it was a sporting event or a church event, you know, that's what, the, what, we, did. That's what we did. Uh, do, do you have any uh, standout uh, event, something that really um, is, is one of your favorite memories about these events or um, sporting activities that you, you you have participated in? Well, with when you got to high school, mainly, um, your important sporting goods would be basically football or um, basketball. For football, of course, the ultimate um, social event would be centered around homecoming. All the preparation for that, be it the floats, be it the... the king and queen or whatever you had. So it would all be centered, you know, everything would be leading up to homecoming, which was a big event because not only are you going to get the current people that are in school with you, but you're always going to get the people, the alumni, people that have graduated that are thrilled or glad to come back and share their stories of what they did and how the homecoming game was when they were there. And in the communities, and I think this is pretty true of all of the communities, the main church events, the ones that I enjoyed the most, were the ones that we classified as, again, homecomings. But they were basically for the churches. So you would invite all the churches, or many churches would come for this one annual celebration at this particular church. Um, and of course, it always centered around food, and it was just the best food ever. Um, I happened to be raised in a family of great cooks. My father cooked all his life. He was a chef all his life. Um, I was truly spoiled. My mother cooked nothing. He cooked everything. <laughs> and I remember him cooking for some of those large events in the community of Lakeland. And um, he went wasn't big on being inside the church, but he would come in and do cooking for the large events, and everybody seemed to really enjoy it. And during the summer, he would do his famous barbecue, and people would come around from various communities and want some of Daddy's, you know, barbecue and that kind of thing. Um, so those were basically, and again, 
even though one you're talking about a high school function homecoming football game and the other you're talking about a church a community game basically it's the same thing it's that family connection it's friends and family it's food and it's music church is the church music and the other is the you know secular music music but it's still just a general good feeling that you got from being in that place in that space at that time so let's let me ask a little bit about uh, your work now what you do now and how that connects uh, to to your upbringing how would you how would you describe that you share that with us? Okay. Um, I retired some time ago from Verizon, and um, when you retire, you kind of have a plan that you're going to do for the next phase of your life, and as most of us, that certainly has shifted many times. But um, who I am today is um, a local historian, a genealogist. I um, started in 1991, which is shortly after the death of my mom, and I know in getting her family history together, um, it dawned on me that even though I lived in a community where my mother was born and raised, I did know a lot about that community, but I didn't know as much as I know today. Um, my dad also was born in Prince George's County also, right down the road from College Park in Hyattsville and in North Brentwood. So I had the influences there also, but when I looked at my dad who was left behind after my mom's death, I realized that I was very void in knowing more of my dad's history. Again, I did not know any of his parents. And even though I was named after my dad's mother, whose name was Viola, so my name came from that, I knew very little of her and I had no picture of any grandparent or great parent, grandparent at that time. So that started me to start to question who I am and, and how did we get here. Um, I, as I said, I knew my mother lived in Lakeland, but I wasn't sure how long she lived in Lakeland. And then, so I just opened up this window to genealogy, and I now feel that I, even in the void of not having a photo of some grandparents, I still can paint a picture in my head of them because I have been able to research and document who they are and what their contributions were to the community and to, to my life. And these grandparents and great-grandparents, great-grandparents were slaves. And what, how did they get from, in some cases it was Westmoreland County, Virginia, or it was Caroline County, Virginia, or it was Calvert County, Maryland. What inspired them to come out of slavery and get in, come to Prince George's County and say, wow, this is where I want to stay. I want to plant my feet here. I want to grow and expand my family here. So I started with, on this journey doing um, genealogy, and it has just opened my eyes to so many things. I've learned more about the state of Maryland. I've learned more about certainly Prince George's County and all of the communities that the family, you know, was part of. Um, we are so much bigger than the little bit of facts that we have in front of us. And if kids today realize that it truly was what other people before them did that got them to where they are now, and that need to always respect that, and, and want to do something in their memory. Um, in doing the genealogy, I love to do genealogy workshops to help people on their journey, and I'm always amazed, no matter how old they are, when they find that document and say, oh my God, that's my grandmother, that's my great-grandmother, that's their handwriting. 
Mm-hmm. And that light bulb moment comes on where they realize this is where they were at this particular time and what they were doing. I think it helps them on, on their journey. Um, I'm involved in projects that help um, identify grave sites and people that are buried there. A lot of the African American grave sites are being disturbed. Um, and we need to know that this is important. We need to try to do something to stop um, this disruption. Uh, our people think a lot about how we're going to be buried, where we're going to be buried. And they think this is their final resting place, only to have chosen a part of, uh, of the land that someone could easily come in and say, I need this for a highway, I need this for whatever. And it's the African American cemeteries that are disappearing more than the others. So um, we need to be more aware of um, what's happening with their family. But through genealogy, I just have uh, been able to expand my world, and I'm in the process of trying to document it and put it in a book form, which. Uh, it's taken a while, but um, I'm just very glad to have the opportunity to do that um, because there are a lot of people that went through a lot of things for us to get to where we are today. So I want to always value that. All right. Well, I'd like to say thank you for uh, taking the time to talk with us and participate in this oral history project. Uh, we really appreciate it. We thank you uh, very much for sharing your story with us.